see my slides. Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you. Let me hide my own face. So uh, here I'm to present the latest ISWOC uh, practice guidelines for the performance of an 11 to 14 weeks ultrasound scan. And you can scan the QR code here to have direct access to the paper. Performing a routine ultrasound examination at 11 to 14 weeks of gestation is of value for confirming viability and plurality, accurate pregnancy dating, screening for aneuploidies, identification of major structural anomalies, and screening for preterm preeclampsia. So this talk is divided into five parts. Uh, this guideline aims to provide guidance for healthcare practitioners performing or planning to perform pregnancy scans at this time point. In general, uh, the main purpose of uh, pregnancy ultrasound scan is to provide accurate information which will facilitate delivery of optimized antenatal care, ensuring the best possible outcomes for the mother and the fetus. So when should it be done? As I have already mentioned, it should be done uh, when the gestational age is estimated to be between 11 to 14 weeks of gestation, as this provides an opportunity to achieve the aforementioned aims. So who should do it? Individuals who perform obstetrical scans routinely should have specialized training that is appropriate to the practice of diagnostic ultrasound for pregnant women. Equipment, uh, it is recommended to use equipment that undergoes regular maintenance and servicing. And how should we document the scan? An examination report should be produced as an electronic and or paper document. The document should be stored locally and in, in accordance with local protocol made available to the woman and referring healthcare provider. You can refer to the paper, for example. There are no indications that the use of B-mode or M-mode prenatal ultrasonography may be harmful during the first trimester due to the limited acoustic output. However, scanning time should be limited and the lowest possible power output should be used to obtain diagnostic information according to the ALARA principle. These guidelines represent an international benchmark for the first trimester ultrasound scan. Specializations must be given to local circumstances, protocols, and medical practice. How about multiple pregnancy, which is uh, obviously not the focus of this document, but then we do emphasize the, the importance of um, determination of coronicity and amniosity, uh, which is, is important for care, testing, and management of multifetal pregnancies. So, um, let me move on to the different sections now. In early pregnancy, viability is defined by identification of a fetal heartbeat. This is most easily performed using ultrasound. And, and once viability is demonstrated, it is important to confirm the intrauterine nature of the pregnancy. An intrauterine gestational sac should be completely bounded by myometry. And this is best assessed by performing a sweep covering the entire uterus, which is a good practice point. The integrity of the uterus muscle may be breached when a pregnancy is located in a cesarean section scar or associated with a rudimentary uterine horn. Uh, we need to determine this. So moving on to assessing fetal biometry, chromium length should be measured as part of the routine first trimester scan, either transabdominally or transvaginally. And fetus should be in a neutral position as shown in this picture. Image should be magnified to fill um, uh, most of the width of the ultrasound screen. Calipers uh, should be placed on the endpoints of the crown and rump. When multiple chromium length measurements have been taken, gestational age should be assessed based on the best quality chromium length um, between 45 to 84 millimeters as the required ultrasound image is well defined. Then BPD and head circumference are measured on the largest symmetrical axial view of the fetal head AC is measured at the outer surface of the skin line on the transverse section of the fetal abdomen. The femur length is measured on the long axis of the femur. Caliper is placed on the ends of the ossified diaphysis, clearly visible. So now I move on to assessment of fetal anatomy. And, and I think that is really the most uh, interesting part of, of this talk and something uh, uh, relatively uh, challenging, but important. Um, a significant, significant proportion of structural anomalies can be detected through a uh, detailed systematic examination for fetal, uh, of fetal anatomy between the 11 to 14 weeks of gestation. And these anomalies will only be reliably detected if 
examination of a structure is included in the protocol for routine assessment. An adequate time is allocated for a structural survey at this time point. Visualization of many anatomical details by ultrasound is best achieved at around 13 weeks of gestation. And that detail assessment of fetal anatomy is best achieved with the use of high resolution of transabdominal and transvaginal transducers. So some uh, sonographic features of structural ab uh, abnormality have been described only relatively recently, and it is not clear how these markers perform in population screening. In this document, we therefore describe two levels of screening, presenting both a checklist of minimum requirements for basic structural surveys, and, and as shown in this table on the left and a more advanced level of best practice for comprehensive detailed examination of the fetus in the first trimester. And I will go through this part of the piece. And later on, Ravi will uh, share with us an ultrasound demonstration. Similar, but... So, um... Hello? Okay. So basically, uh, the most important thing to start with the scan, an overview of the fetus, uterus and placenta. This is best done with a sweep of the whole uterus, confirming that it is a singleton pregnancy. And, and, and we, this will give you an overview, an overview of the fetus, uterus and placenta. Now a sweep down, uh, the, uh, uh, we will look at a head and brain. The examination of a fetal head and CNS is best achieved using a combination of axial and mid-functional plane. The cerebral region is dominated by lateral ventricles, that appear large and are mostly filled with the slightly asymmetric echogenic choroplexes in the posterior two thirds, the typical butterfly sign. A lower plane within the head shows the two thalami and the posterior fossa region with the cerebral peduncles of the, and, and the aqueduct of Silvius, the fourth ventricle and the future cisterna magna as fluid filled structures. Then moving on, uh, looking at also the brain, face and neck, amid, uh, turning the probe 90 degrees, uh, a mid-sagittal plane of the head face can also be used to assess the posterior fossa and visualize the intracranial translucency and the brainstem as a screening test for open neurotube defects and um, cystic posterior fossa abnormalities. The magnified uh, sagittal, mid-sagittal plane of the head and neck enables the assessment of several anatomical regions of the face, including uh, the forehead, the nasal bone, maxilla, mandible, and mouth. The fetal facial profile should be completed by an axial or coronal view of the, uh, with the attempt to visualize the eyes with the inter of distance and the retronasal triangle demonstrating the maxilla and the mandible. So sonographic assessment and measurement of the NT should be part of the screening protocol, independent of whether it is used uh, for the risk assessment of aneuploidy, because increased NT may be a marker for rarer aneuploidies in pregnancies, while self-free DNA has mostly been used to screen for a more limited range of uh, common aneuploidies. Moving on to the thorax, you should note the shape uh, of the thoracic wall, the thoracic cavity with the lungs and heart should be uh, evaluated. The lungs uh, should be should appear homogeneously echogenic, and and there should be no sign of a pleural effusion. Evaluated in an axial uh, or sagittal, parasagittal, or coronal plane, no stomach and liver. At the fetal uh, full chamber plane, ribs. Uh, Sighters, lungs, cardiac precision in the chest are assessed and uh, with the cardiac axis uh, pointing to the left. Color Doppler helps confirm the presence of two distinct ventricles with separate filling in diastole and to exclude a significant atrioventricular valve regurgitation. The examination of the great vessels through an identification of the left ventricular outflow tract and three vessel tachyar view with color Doppler. Uh, uh, demonstrates the presence, number and size of the great vessels, anatomic relationship and direction of blood flow, along with the continuity of the ductal and aortic vessels, ruling out most complex anomalies affecting the great vessels. Now moving down, uh, abdominal content, the position of the stomach on the left side of the abdomen together with levocardia help confirm normal, situs, uh, normal visual situs. 
the fetal kidneys can often be seen in their expected paraspinal location as bean shaped, slightly echogenic structures with typical hypoechoic central uh, renal pelvis. By 12 weeks of gestation, the fetal bladder should be visible as a median hypoechoic round structure in the lower abdomen with a longitudinal diameter of less than seven millimeters. The normal insertion of the umbilical cord should be documented after 12 weeks um, because the physiologic midgut herniation is present up to 11 weeks and should be differentiated from valsial and gastroschisis. The number of cord vessels and cord insertion at the umbilicus should be noted. Brief evaluation of the paraphysical region and uh, with color or cow doppler can be helpful in confirming the presence of two umbilical arteries. However, single umbilical artery does not constitute an anomaly, but is associated with congenital anomalies and future growth restriction. The spine should be examined when possible in sagittal view to show normal vertebral alignment and integrity of the skin covering. Then looking at the limbs, the presence of three segments of both upper and lower limbs and presence and normal orientation of the two hands and feet should be noted as. Last but not least, the placenta should be assessed and it should appear as slightly echogenic with uniformed homogeneous echo texture in early gestation without the presence of small or large cysts or lacunae. The presence or absence of uh, subchorionic hematoma should be assessed. Amniotic fluid in early gestation is um, rarely reduced or increased as observed in the second trimester and cannot be used as a hint for anomalies. And the amniotic membranes are often well seen as a sac uh, surrounding the fetus and not yet fused with the chorion. And in multiple pregnancies, chorionicity and amniocity should be determined and documented. Uh, a reminder that uh, 3D and 4D ultrasound are not routinely uh, used for uh, fresh trimester fetal anatomical evaluation. So moving on to covering common annual ploidy screening, uh, there are two common tests uh, used to screen for common annual ploidy, uh, the combined test um, and the cell-free DNA testing. Screening by the cell-free DNA testing has been demonstrated to achieve um, excellent screening performance for common aneuploides. For trisomy 21, the cell-free DNA test can detect 99.7% of cases at a very low false positive rate, way less than 0.1%. Uh, and the respective figures for trans trisomy 18 and 13 are 98% and 99%. The test uh, has been introduced as a second tier screening following the fresh trimester combined screening. It is not recommended as a standalone test without the performance of the 11 to 14 week scan. Um, in relation to fetal nuclear translucency, uh, this term describes the echolucent uh, region seen at the back of the neck during uh, the scan. And T should be measured at, at, in the mid sagittal section using an image magnified to include the head and thorax of the fetus only. Measurement calipers change in 0.1 millimeters increments, and several other ultrasound markers for aneuploidy have been described. Uh, the first one is delayed ossification of the nasal bone, reported as hyperplastic or absence of the nasal bone. Uh, it is a powerful marker in screening for trisomy 21. So uh, the, second, the second additional marker is assessment of the ductus venosus flow. Uh, functional anomalies include abnormal flow in the ductus venosus, uh, um, is, is, uh, has been described in the sequence of trisomy 21. The ductus venosus is normally assessed in a right paramedian section. Color doppler is used to identify flow returning through the umbilical vein and ductus venosus to the right atrium. And flow through the tricuspid valve is assessed by identifying the full chamber view in an axial section of the thorax. And we know that um, a tricuspid regurgitation is also associated with an increased risk of trisomy 21. And then uh, how do we define tricuspid regurgitation is that if there is flow uh, um, uh, greater than 60 centimeters per second for more than 50% of the cardiac cycle, then this is considered to be tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, looking at the combined test, 
uh, the mixture model proposed and made freely available by the Fetal Medicine Foundation has been prospectively assessed and found to have 90% sensitivity or 97% um, specificity when screening for trisomy 21 uh, and the respective um, uh, sensitivity detection rate for uh, trisomy 18, 13 Turner syndrome are 97%, 92% and 95% respectively. So moving on swiftly, just want to let you uh, glance over this table because uh, we need to acknowledge that there are different screening algorithms uh, being available and that the choice will depend on the available resources. And in the guidelines, we have summarized the screening performance for Transomy 21 according to these four different policies, combined screening, combined screening plus new markers, anomaly scan and uh, NT measurement prior to self-free DNA testing, and combined screening with self-free DNA testing and the respective screening performance is um, illustrated in the table. Very, very useful reference for all of, the, all of us who actually provide screening for common aneuploidies. So um, the last part of this is in relation to uh, the risk assessment of obstetric complications. And I think it's important also to emphasize that this is uh, a new part to uh, the guidelines. Um, this 11-14 week scan we believe is an important opportunity to provide assessment of these uh, pregnancy complications. And first of all, uh, we need to remind ourselves that actually um, often patients talk about a low line placenta at that time point and to be honest, the position, the position of the placenta in relation to the cervix is of less important at the stage of pregnancy since most placentas are not low line by mid trimester. And uh, so we should not be reporting placenta preview at this stage because that actually generates some degree of anxiety amongst the pregnant women. Special attention should be given to the increasing number of patients with a prior cesarean delivery who may be predisposed to a scar pregnancy or placenta accretor spectrum disorders with significant uh, complications. At this scan, ultrasound signs suggestive of um, placenta accretor spectrum disorders can be detected, uh, typically uh, low, uh, low anterior implantation of the placenta or gestational sac next to or in the scar niche is the most common early ultrasound sign associated with PS disorders. And depending on local resources, it may be sought by the use of transvaginal ultrasound at the time of this late first trimester scan in women with a prior cesarean delivery. So you hear more from Professor Nicolides later today, but I do want to highlight the importance of the first trimester preclampsia screening at this time point. And so I won't dwell on this, but um, in our guidelines, we have, highlight, we have highlighted the importance of incorporating the measurement of uterine artery positivity index as part of the scan protocol at this 11 to 14 week scan. So during the same transabdominal scan for the measurement of fetal nipple translucent thickness and diagnosis of any major fetal defects, and I think you can take uh, 50 seconds to measure the uterine artery pulsatility index. And here is the standardized protocol for its measurement. And during the scan, a sagittal section of the uterus is obtained and the cervical canal and internal os are identified. Subsequently, keeping the transducer in the midline and tilting it gently to the sides with the use of the color flow mapping, each uterine artery is identified along the side of the cervix and uterus at the level of the internal os. Pulsed wave Doppler is used with a sampling gate of point, uh, two millimeters to cover the whole vessel and care is taken to ensure that the angle of insulation is less than 30 degrees. When three similar consecutive waveforms are obtained, the uterine artery PI is measured with automatic tracing and the mean uh, uterine artery PI of the left and right arteries is calculated. So following the screening, then high-risk women should be advised to take aspirin 150 milligrams uh, before 16 weeks of gestation. And in women with low calcium intake, we should advise for calcium supplement. So here comes the end of my, my talk. I've gone, gone through this rather quickly, but I am showing you the QR code again in case you missed the opportunity to scan and have after access to the guidelines. So thank you for your attention and we'll be taking some questions at the end. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Poon. That was a great one and um, very highly appreciated. I think we'll go straight to the video presentation by Rabi. Rabi is also very well known in the ESOC circle. Having been a board member of ESOC for over 10 years, between 2003 and 2013, he is a recipient of the very prestigious Scott Campbell Award for Education in 2018. He's also a very prolific writer, having published so many books on ultrasound. It's also worthy of note that he has special interest in first trimester ultrasound scan, and we'll be presenting some videos on very relevant to the practice of first trimester ultrasound scan. Professor Rabbi, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to perform a live scan, so I chose a patient I've seen last week, and uh, these are good scanning conditions at 12 weeks gestation plus six. Ideally, would have taken one at 13 weeks, but it would have been too, too good to uh, demonstrate all the things. So it is the everyday's life. So you see here, I'm struggling a little bit on the position of the fetus. It's hiding here in the upper part of the uterus, but uh, you see here, I'm magnifying the face to get a mid sagittal view. I'm tilting the probe until I get a quite nice profile. Even in the era of NIPT, I still perform the measurement of the nasal bone and uh, the nuclear translucency. And you see here magnification. So this is a good plane to demonstrate the nasal bone. You see the maxilla has here in the uh, posterior aspect two lines. These are the superimposed line to rule out uh, cleft. You see here, this is a view of the head with the to the falx cerebri and the two uh, choroid plexus. I like this plane because I move them downward to demonstrate the two eyes here, the two orbits, then later on to demonstrate uh, the maxilla, the mandible, and the mandibular gap, and then the two ears. So I then I switch the pro tilt the probe to get again a mid sagittal view to demonstrate here the from left to right the maxilla without maxillary gap. The posterior aspect you see here the um, Intracranial translucency with the brain with the brain stem, and then I move the probe to the right and to the left to demonstrate the one hand with the thumb and the fingers, and returning back to the face, go I go to the left side to demonstrate the other hand. So you see, this is the plane where I will have measured the nuclear translucency. I did not did it. I did not do it in this example. Now, after the hands, I go to the to the feet to show the presence of two feet. I try to get always uh, the foot palm to see the feet from below. Sometimes I'll look at the gender as seen in this plane. So again here, to finish with the, with the limbs. I try always to show uh, both uh, limbs to the parents and not uh, uh, I mean simultaneously and not one after the other. So I see here the the stomach is well seen. I can measure and display in the abdominal circumference. I measure the femur. Personally, I do measure always a femur and abdominal circumference and BPD with the head circumference and the crown rumbling. So this is here, the head with the, with the BPD measured. So, and then uh, this is the good view to measure uh, the crown rump length. I would have measured also here the nuclear translucency. So, let's hurry a little bit. Again, here the hands, the feet. So, now uh, then I use the sensitive color to demonstrate the two umbilical arteries surrounding the bladder. I prefer to do it. Some people do not like to, to do it in the guidelines. We put it as optional. Then I demonstrate here the normal uh, course of the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus and, and try to get a sample volume to see if the flow is normal or highly pulsatile or a reversal flow. So I'm getting now the hepatic vein and move a little bit more toward the, 
Da, da se nu zas vede quite normal angle. So, let's move forward. Now, see here the heart can be in good position. So, I will magnify a change now to the cardiac preset. I magnify the image and get first the view to, on the upper abdomen to recognize the site. This, the stomach is on the left. The heart apex is pointing to the left. I try to get a lateral view to demonstrate the two uh, uh, AV valves and the two ventricles with the septum. And then I use the sensitive color to demonstrate the filling of the two ventricles by reducing the, the gain and uh, the, the output. And then to, the, to get to the three vessel trachea view. As you see, I don't get a left ventricular outflow tract on routine, so I get the three vessel trachea view. Here, I try to demonstrate the crossing of the vessels by getting the sweep. I'll show you again. Go, go back. So you see here, this is a sweep here. And now you see this. this yeah, now you see the sweep here. And then I switch to the very sensitive uh, color to demonstrate the presence of the normal subclavian artery. So this is a sensitive uh, slow flow color and demonstrate the subclavian artery from the trachea. So I do it this, uh, yeah, for personal reasons. So it's my my personal approach. Yeah, then it's with the heart, it's done. Let's abandon the heart and go back to the general preset. You see again, the hands in front of the face or the abdomen. This is the brain stem, the intracranial translucent. The distance is also uh, s smaller than the brain stem itself. Yeah, now I still need uh, to see the kidney. So I hit the fetus that it turns a little bit that I can see the spine from behind and then get a, an, an axial view or coronal view to demonstrate the two kidneys and the view on the spine. So this is here one, one kidney with the pelvis and the other one is well seen here. So I hit a little bit on the abdomen that the baby turns. You see the baby is still hiding this uh, position here. Again, the feet, the bladder now is filled. So we have seen now the limbs, we've seen the bladder, the kidneys, the uh, the situs, the normal connection of the, uh, of the lattice sphenosis. We have seen the face in different uh, positions, the intracerebral, features so uh, i would have uh, liked to have a better view on the intracranial features but what i will do now is uh, uh, this is the endocervix measured then uh, we go to to do some doppler this is here the uh, before i start i will have a look to the placenta if you can see the attachment of the umbilical cord and use this as an occasion to uh, to let the lady listen to the heartbeat of the baby and then I, do, I will do it on the umbilical cord simply to not to put a lot of energy directly on the fetus. So this is here the the fetal uh, heart rate and the, the umbilical doppler actually without any clinical significance at this stage but I oblige myself, myself to look at the, uh, the attachment of the cord and then I will move to uh, to the cervix and then uh, tilt once to the right and to the left in order to get the uterine artery. This is the right side. And then I move to get the other side to the left side here. I will jump a little bit. And this is the left uh, the left side. And then at the end, I will finish my examination by doing a 3D of the fetus. So, even if the images are not very good from abdominal, but it's uh, nice to have a view on the fetus uh, this way. This is a life now examination. And the head now is free, it's not hiding anymore. So I uh, took the probe again to demonstrate the different planes. So this is the transventricular view. And then you can uh, divide your screen to four parts. So that you see here, this is the trans ventricular with the two um, choroid plexus, then this is one more transthalamic, one with the posterior uh, fossa with the cerebral peduncles and the aqueduct of sylvius. 
and here again one another one with the was supposed to be the IT region. I will move now. I will leave this. I will move now to one uh, to two minutes on a transvaginal scan on another fetus. So you see, this is also very good scanning condition at 12 week gestation. We saw first the feet. You see the umbilical cord, the bladder. You see the quality is completely better. But on the other hand, it's not always the case. So I chose one case where you can see clearly. So and then moving upward, you see the heart quite nicely. So what I will see now, we'll try to see the face. Optimizing the picture, magnifying the image. You see here the two uh, choroid plexus, the phallus, the aqueduct of Sylvius, even the developing cerebellum here, and the, uh, the fourth ventricle with the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. A view to the face, here you see the two eyes, the maxilla region. In this position, I cannot get any profile, so this is a challenge of first semester transvaginal. You see the two hands were seen. Then I move now to a fetal cardio preset. I make the picture more contrasty, magnifying the image. And then um, we'll see if we can you see the stomach here, the heart is on the left. So I've seen at least two images, the two pictures needed for, to see the situs, the filling of the four chamber view on color, and uh, moving to the three vessel and trachea view to demonstrate the crossing of the vessels and the patency of the two. Uh, Great vessels, and you see the trachea here being uh, in the middle, and the two vessels to the right. The subclavian artery is normally as well. You can demonstrate here the lung veins, but this is not really an aim of the first semester. So, and in a more coronal view, I will try to uh, demonstrate with one the presence of one kidney here, even doing the same hitting. Now, when the baby is, uh, let's say, not touching the anterior wall, this is ideal to, to perform uh, 3D because you need to have a free, uh, free area here that the baby does not touch the wall, and you can have a free uh, 3D of the fetus. So this is here, approach. So this is one of the main advantages of having transvaginal scan that you can uh, uh, have an overview on the fetus this way and uh, can play with the different presets. So in other words, in summary, I tried to show you the new, uh, let's say, the checklist of the new guidelines. We saw that I was I was able to demonstrate the measurement of the crown round plank, the attachment of the medical cord, the head and the different planes in axial views. I hope I showed you the profile and the frontal view of the eyes and the maxilla, the four chamber view uh, uh, on 2D, the color and the three vessel trachea view the stomach and the upper abdomen, the attachment of the umbilical cord and the two arteries surrounding the filled bladder. The bladder was not uh, uh, enlarged and a sagittal view to demonstrate that the size is less than seven millimeters. I personally prefer to have a coronal view to demonstrate the two kidneys. I showed you abdominal and transvaginally and uh, rarely you are able to get, uh, let's say, such a view in addition to the profile. So, but uh, the, two, uh, the two legs and the two hands were also seen. So I think this is a good summary and of, uh, of my live demo, and I hope uh, uh, you, uh, you do similar or you get some inspiration. And I thank you very much for your kind attention.